Heavenly Father, creator of all things, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to come in your presence and to pray and to bring our petitions to you this morning. Father God, first let me ask you to forgive me of my sins and my shortcomings. Forgive me, Heavenly Father, of anything I may have thought, said, or done that would hamper this prayer in any way. Father God, as we go from day to day, help us, dear Father, to be more like your Son, Jesus. Help us, dear God, to work with one another. Help us, Heavenly Father, to understand that this work is not for individuals, but it is to hasten your coming. So, Lord, we ask that you will give us the direction, give us the wisdom, give us the understanding, Father, and to give us the ability to work things out one with another. Because, Father, this is not a battle of flesh and blood, but your word tells us this is a battle of principalities and powers in high places. And the only way that we can be victorious, dear Lord, in this battle is by your Holy Spirit. So, Father, we ask that you will anoint us with your Holy Spirit. Father, fill us afresh and anew with your Holy Spirit. Abide with us, dear God, so that we will be able to fight this battle and win it according to your word, according to your ways, and according to your riches and glory. And Father, we'll be careful to give you all the glory, honor, and praise. Father, those that have been dealing with bereavement, those that have been dealing with sadness and sickness, Father God, there are those that have been dealing with loneliness. There are those, dear Father, that's dealing with homelessness. Oh God, please have mercy on each and every one of them. Have mercy, dear God, and guide us all, Lord, in the way that you would have us go. Help us, dear Father, to know what your will is for our lives. And help us, dear Lord, to be willing to surrender our own will to your will so that your will will be done. And Father God, as we go forth today, we ask you, Lord Jesus, to bless the person that is going to be delivering your word today. Father, anoint him with words from on high. Anoint him, Father God. Anoint his tongue. Anoint his voice, Father God. And strengthen him to be able to deliver a word from you, quickened by your Holy Spirit. Oh, Lord, we thank you. We ask you, Lord, to bless each and every person from Ephesus Church. Bless each and every person from fellowship church bless each and every person dear lord that is listening to this broadcast right now wherever they are wherever they are from dear father and bless our pastor in a mighty way and his family dear lord we ask that you will continue to strengthen him heal him guide him in the way that you would have him go and father we'll be careful to give you all the glory honor and praise and father if there's anything or anybody that i left out of this prayer that i should have included right now lord you know who they are and i ask you lord jesus to do a special anointing with those people help them father to not feel that they're alone let them know god that you are there and you are a God that has never failed. You have never lost a case. So, Lord, we thank you. We believe in you. We trust you. We love you. We lift up your holy and righteous name. And we'll be careful to give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. 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 Good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone. It's good to see everyone and have God's blessings upon us. We're going to ask of you if you would please prepare yourself for the morning of the morning uh, tithes and offerings to be collected. And while you are preparing for that, I would like to say I was thinking about some fish the other night and how God brought these creatures into existence. And he said to the waters, multiply, multiply, and um, 
the waters brought forth those fishes and and there was multitudes and multitudes of all kinds of fish and that brings to mind about God's blessing in a such a way that uh, if you could possibly count the fishes you might be able to count God's blessing but it is impossible I say to you to count the many, many fishes that are in the waters of these great oceans. Therefore, you cannot count God's blessings. When he says that he would open up the windows of heaven and pour you out blessings, that you would have not enough room to receive them because God's blessings are much, much, much greater than the fishes of the sea. So at this time, we're going to ask everyone if you would just Prepare out yourselves as we collect this Sabbath tithe and the offerings. Let us pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, we are thankful once again for your goodness and for your love for us. We are thankful, O oh God, that you have given us such a great opportunity such as this to be able to come forth with your uh, gifts, dear Lord, that you have allowed us to earn. We're thankful, dear Lord, that you bless us and keep us, O oh God, health and strength. We're thankful, dear Lord, for the opportunities that we have that we can work and have uh, an income that we can give to your cause. And we ask, O oh God, if you would continue to bless each one who had it to give today. And we pray, dear Lord, that you would even touch those hearts who did not have it to give, but yet had it in their hearts that they wanted to give to the Lord's cause. We just give thanks, O God, for your goodness. Now, Father, we ask in Jesus' name if you would bless the offerings uh, that has been received in your name. May you uh, bring prosperity to them, Father, that they can go and do the work, that this gospel might be finished in all the world, and that you can come and take us home where we will be with you forever. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. Good morning, saints. Let us pray this morning as we dwell upon the subject, Do you see what I see? Do you see what I see? Let us pray. Father in heaven, now is your moment to magnify your word put me in the background father and I pray that Jesus may stand forth as a teacher of his word today bless us that we may do according to all thou sayest in the law empower us we pray in Jesus name amen a man fell off a cliff but managed to grab a tree limb on the way down. And the following conversation ensued. The man says, is anyone up there? And all of a sudden you hear a voice that's the Lord that says, I am here. I am the Lord. Do you believe me? The man replied, yes, Lord, I believe. I really believe, but I can't hang on much longer. And the Lord says, that's all right. If you really believe, you have nothing to worry about. I will save you. Just let go of the branch. And the man paused for a moment, and then he replied, Is anyone else up there? <laughs> While this story may amuse, it definitely brings up a serious issue in the human experience with God. We have been beat up by trials and tribulations and the devil, and we long to see the loving, smiling face of our Heavenly Father. We often use the phrase, a sight for sore eyes for something or someone you are glad to see. For someone hanging on, on the branch of a cliff, anyone would have been a sight for sore eyes, especially God. However, just like the man in the story, we believe in God's power to deliver us but often we struggle with believing in God's love for us. 
We need to understand that the most compelling and powerful thing about God is not his power and the demonstration thereof. Again, the most powerful thing about God is not his power and the demonstration thereof, but the most powerful thing about God is his love and the demonstration thereof. This man believed in God's power to deliver him, but he did not trust in God's love for him when it required him to let go of the branch. This teaches us a very important lesson about faith. That lesson is found in Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, where it tells us that the only faith that avails with Christ is that which worketh by love. If the man in the story truly believed that God loved him, he would have trusted him en enough to let go of the branch. And so it is with us. If we truly believe that God loves us, we will also lay aside every weight, which means to let go. Lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, according to Hebrews 12, verse 1. The Bible also defines love by telling us in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. In other words, our faith, which worketh by love, according to Galatians, is only awakened by knowing his love for us first. In the Old Testament, in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, it says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. So obviously, there is a mishap, a, 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 a disconnection that has happened in the way that we see things. Do you see what I see? Okay, let's go to our, our first slide, uh, Brother Graham. And it's found from the Review and Herald. And Graham, is it possible? <laughs> I'm a, you, you probably gonna have to take the, take this part of the sermon up. But is it possible you could put it on the screen for me? As a matter of fact, the book of Revelation gives us some counsel that we can follow. And, it, it, and it's actually the wisest counsel given to any of the seven churches, especially because the church of Laodicea is the end time church. And it's the church that's living during the time of the judgment. And um, the, the counsel given there is very applicable to our situation today. And it says in verse 9, or actually it says, uh, not in verse 9, excuse me. It says in verse 17, Because thou sayest I am rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, <coughs> excuse me, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And the last thing, the most important thing, he says, and, that, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. Let's look at this, something about this eye salve, found in the first slide. It's from the Review and Herald. If we could go there real quick, Graham, the very first slide. It says in Review and Herald, uh, paragraph 5 from November 23, 1897, says the eye is the sensitive conscience, the inner light of the mind. Of course, what do you need a light to see? 
uh, you, you need a light to see <laughs> what I meant to say. Upon its correct view of things, the spiritual healthfulness of the whole soul and being depends. The I salve, which is the word of God, makes the conscious smart under its application for it convicts of sin. So when God tells us in Revelation, given the very last counsel to the, to, the, to the Laodicean church, he says, anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. What he's saying is, is that we need to take the word of God and apply it so that we have clear eyesight. And what are some things that we need to see? Basically, there are three things we need to see. We need to see the, we need to see God, as he's revealed in the Bible, we need to see ourselves as we're as 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 revealed in the Bible. And we need to also see the world as revealed in the Bible. And if we can anoint our eyes with that eye salve, then we can see things as they really are, because as of right now, we're blind. That's what the scripture says. We're blind, miserable, poor, naked and wretched. Let's go to the next slide real quick. It says the professed Christian world is indeed in need of eye salve that they may see the character of God and his law. It says the whole Christian world, that includes Baptists, that includes Pentecostals, that includes Catholics, that includes, yea, us even as Seventh-day Adventists, we need eye salve so that we can see the character of God and his law because really that's what salvation is all about salvation what jesus primarily came to do is not merely to save us from this world that is a part of it but the primary job of redemption is to save us from a picture of god that the devil has painted Again, the Lord says in Jeremiah 29, verse 11, says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord of hosts, uh, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. See, because we would sometimes whenever uh, the Lord's will cuts across our human inclinations, we actually think and you don't have to say nothing. I'm a human being. You're a human being. We all have these experiences whenever the Lord's will cuts across our human inclinations. And especially whenever it involves suffering, we tend to think that the Lord is against us. According to the Bible in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, that faith which worketh by love is the only way in which we are to have victory. For it reads, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. What type of faith? The faith that works by love. And how does faith work by love? Tune in. <laughs> Faith is all about seeing. Do we see what God sees? That's the question of the hour. Do you see what I see? That's a question that God is posing to us today. Do you see what I see? Oftentimes as, 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 as a parent and my children, they want to do, Jaden and Joshua want to do something and um, they don't have the, they, 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 they haven't experienced life enough. And sometimes there are things that they want to be involved in, where as a parent, I have to step in and say, no, you can't do that. Not because I want to spoil their fun, but because I have seen things that they have not seen, and they are not able to see what I see yet. Now, going through life a little bit, you know, and, 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 and whenever they get on their own, especially when they start paying their own bills and all that stuff, then they'll start seeing what I see. But as of right now, I, they have to, uh, they, they, children have to be trained to trust their parents that their parents can see things that they're not able to see. And faith, which worketh by love, is the key. So let's make that practical. 
And I've said this many times before, but I'm going to say it again because it's pertinent to the lesson. <clears throat> Let's go to our third slide, I believe it is, Mr. Graham. This will give us the, 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 the spirit-inspired definition of the faith which worketh by love, by which we truly See God and see what God sees. Education chapter 30, the very first sentence in that chapter in the book Education says, faith is trusting God, believing that he loves us and knows best what is for our good. Because remember, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, that God uh, knowing what's best for our good was kind of in question in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. And, the, and God had to say, no, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. You don't know the thoughts that I think towards you. So, so inspired by the Holy Ghost, the author says, faith, seeing God, is trusting God, believing that he loves us and knows best what is for our good. So let us go down to the hall of faith and plug in that definition of faith and see if it can revitalize and make practical what it means to see what God sees. Let's just go to Hebrews chapter 11 real quick. Now, now, first of all, look at this first definition. I'm, I'm going to start with verse one. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, let's 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 plug in the inspired definition of faith that we read from the book Education. Faith is trusting God. So let's look at this. Now, trusting God, believing that he loves us and knows best what is for our good is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Oh, man, I get excited on that one. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. How about trusting God, believing that he loves us and knows best what is for our good is the substance of things that are hoped for, the evidence of things that you ain't even seen yet. See, some of us are going through trials and tribulations right now and going through some really hard times, and, and, and we still have to hold on and trust God and know that even though we can't see it with our natural eyes, we believe that God loves us and knows what is best for our good. And therefore, we can rejoice even in the midst of what we're going through right now. <laughs> Oh man, let's 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 look at this. I'm gonna go with verse five. Enoch. Enoch. It says, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Woo! My goodness. It says, by faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Let's plug in our de the definition. By trusting God, believing that he loved him and knew what was best for his good, Enoch was translated that he shouldn't see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Let's go to verse 6. But without faith, it is, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Again, y'all got to hold me back now. I get excited at this stuff. It says, we're going to plug in where it says faith. We're going to plug in the spirit of prophecy definition of faith. But without trusting God... <laughs> Believing that he loves us and knows best what is for our good, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I'm going go to I'm gonna give two more examples before I move on. Verse 8 with Abraham. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Woo. It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. 
And he went out not knowing whither he went. Okay, we're going to plug in the definition again. Instead of saying by faith Abraham, we're going to plug in the definition. By trusting God, <laughs> believing that he loved him and knew what was best for his good, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and he went out not knowing where he goes. See, when you believe that God loves you and that, 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 he lo that when you trust him because he loves you and he knows what's best for your good, you don't have to know where God is leading you. You just obey and you just follow him. Look at, look at another one, another powerful one, and this is my last example before uh, I go. It talks about Moses. It says, by faith Moses, in verse 24, uh, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Because you realize Moses was next in line to be, to, to, to be the Pharaoh. It says, by faith Moses... Plug in our definition again. I know it's tedious, but it sure helped me. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> by trusting God, by trusting God, believing that he loved him and knew what was best for his good, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Esteeming the, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of of sin for a season. So because he trusted God, believing that God loved him and knew what was best for his good, Abraham chose affliction. Now, 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 y'all know that's counter, that, that's counterintuitive to our desires as human beings. You know <laughs> that if God lays out the path of affliction before you and lays out the path of ease before you, be honest, which road you going to choose? You will choose the path of least resistance, the path of peace, instead of the path of, uh, of affliction if you're not tuned in with God, if you don't believe, if you don't trust him, believing that he loves you and knows what is best for your good. And then the last example, it says, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured Oh, my goodness. Whew. As seeing him who is invincible, invisible. <laughs> it says, by trusting God, believing that he loved him and knew what was best for his good, he forsook Egypt, didn't fear the wrath of the king, and he endured as seeing him who is invisible. See, when you trust God, when you trust God and you believe that he loves you and knows what is best for your good, you don't have to see him. You don't have to see him with your eyes. And the way that this is all accomplished, remember the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, it tells us that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So how did Moses come to this state? How did all of these, 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 these people in the hall of faith come to that point where they didn't have to see anything, where they were willing to accept affliction rather than ease, where, where, where they were uh, obeying, not knowing where they went? How did they come to such a place? Because they spent time with God in his word and they anointed their eyes with the eye salve, which is the word of God. Let us go to Genesis chapter 3 for our case study today. Again, we read in, in Revelation that Jesus said he was the first and the last, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. So we got to see how we fell into this mess so we'll be able to get out of this mess. I hope that makes sense.
Now that we see what faith is and how faith is intricately tied to seeing and that we know that faith is trusting God and believing that he loves us and knows best what is for our good, we're, we're looking back into the Garden of Eden to see how the devil broke down Adam and Eve, how he broke down their faith by destroying their love for God. And if we can see that, we may be aware of his devices to deceive and destroy us. For I assure you that this is also the way that he approached the angels in heaven and started a rebellion up, in there, up, up there in eternity past. And we'll see that as the story unfolds. And if it worked with perfect holy angels who had never before known sin, and if it also worked with perfect holy human beings who had never before known sin, we are kidding ourselves if we think that it won't work against us. And these four points that I'm about to bring up are bound up the issues and principles at stake in the great controversy. We must always remember that in the great controversy, God primarily is the one on trial, not us. Our only security is to resist these four temptations by faith. And they are, number one, Satan tempts us to believe that God is restrictive. Satan tempts us to believe that God is restrictive. Number two, Satan tempts us to believe that God is a liar. Satan tempts us to believe that God is a liar. If he can tempt you and, and be successful with you in believing that God is restrictive, the next step is automatic. He can tempt you to believe that God is a liar. And once you succumb to that, then point number three comes. Satan tempts us to believe that God is selfish. So once he can convince you that God is restrictive and that God is a liar, the next thing that happens is Satan tempts us to believe that God is selfish. And then the most diabolical of all is point number four, is that Satan tempts us to believe that God is irrelevant. So if he can tempt us to believe that God is restrictive, if he can tempt us to believe that God is a liar, if he can tempt us to believe that God is selfish, then he breaks us down to the most irredeemable part, which is Satan tempts us to believe that God is irrelevant. As we're in Genesis chapter 3, we need to look at Genesis chapters 1 and 2, just a brief overview. We see God creating earth, and everything in it is perfect and holy and in perfect harmony with the will of God. Then in chapter 3, the Genesis narrative takes an unusual turn. It begins <laughs> with a snake talking. Wow. It begins with a snake talking. Hitherto, we haven't even heard of Adam and Eve speaking. The beings that God created in his own image, they haven't even spoke yet in the Bible. But yet, after God, at this point in Genesis 1 and 2, God is the only one that has been speaking, and then all of a sudden now, an animal talks. Something is wrong with this picture. Something should have clicked in Eve's mind that said, animals don't talk. <laughs> Her proper re response, which would have been my response if I see a snake talking, I'm not sticking around to say another word. And as they're talking, and as it, as it is when anybody's talking, there's always a subject of discussion. And the subject of their discussion ends up being God. The subject of their discussion is not about Adam and Eve. It's not about any of the angels who fell. It is about God. And by the way, God is the one, only one really worth talking about. <laughs> He's really the only one worth talking about. But there is a correct way to talk about them, too, as we shall see. <clears throat> In the history of mankind, there are only two instances of animals legitimately talking, and they're both recorded in the Bible. I, I, I haven't read the Quran word for word like I've read the Bible or any other religious book like I've read the Bible, but it, 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 you know, if, if a snapshot picture of what their message is 
uh, has shown me I've never seen any instances in, in, in their books where animals talk. The only place, the only source where you get this information is in the word of God. And according to the word of God, it's only happened twice in human history. The snake in the beginning talking with Adam and Eve and then the, the donkey talking to Balaam. You talk about a Dr. Doolittle. See, she should never have began a dialogue with Snake or Satan. We get into trouble when we try to reason with Satan's suggestions. We should never enter into dialogue with Satan at all, especially whenever it comes to our sins. Let me say that we should never get into dialogue with Satan, especially whenever it comes to our sins. Because if you try to dialogue and reason with him about your sins, he's going to win that battle every time because he got, he got paperwork. He got paperwork on you. And so you'll never win that battle. You'll always feel discouraged just enough to give up because he's going he's gonna to have the facts. That's why you don't need to dialogue with him. I would rather dialogue with God that whenever I sin, the Bible tells me in uh, Proverbs chapter 24, I believe, and, and, and it tells me that a righteous man, uh, that a just man falls seven times. So God has provided us enough power through the Holy Spirit not to fall, but if we fall, according to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And that's what I like to dialogue with, because I know I sin every day. Maybe not in action, you know, as if counting sins is some type of, uh, tra you know, checkpoint stuff. It's not like that. But I know that I at least in thought, uh, uh, you know, I, I have a, a bad thought, a sinful thought every day, and I'm not going to reason with the devil. I'm only going to consult God's word. And God's word says that I have an advocate, and I'm going to use my attorney. Trust me. See, we should never enter, enter into dialogue with Satan. What I mean is that we should never entertain temptation. Once the temptation comes, we need to run and pray. And if we can't run, we still need to pray. Satan was very careful not to make an outright statement to contradict the Bible. Instead, he sought to insinuate doubt and engage her in a conversation with, him, with himself through a most brilliant tactic. He asked a question. He asked a what? He asked a question. See, we need to be, be very, very careful about things that are quote unquote questionable. It's, it's been my experience with Christians that we love to see how close we can get it, how, how close we can get to doing something wrong without sinning. And if you have to question it, most likely you shouldn't be doing it or watching it, or listening to it, or whatever to it. He, all he had was a question for her. And he was able to open up a dialogue through questions. And he questioned God. He questioned God's word. And by the way, this leads us perfectly to the first point that the Lord wants us to be aware of. Satan tempts us to believe that God is restrictive. Look at verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? See, what he's doing here, he's saying, Yea, hath God said. Now, the subject is about God, but it's also about what God has said. Or another way of saying what God has said is because what we say are our words. So basically, what God has said or what God's word has said is that you should, has God's word said that you should not eat of every tree of the garden? Notice how he framed that question. God had freely, God had told them in chapter 2 that they could eat freely of every tree. And he says, ye shall not eat. Has God said ye shall not? So he's already insinuating doubt about God's liberality and his generosity. And he's, that question was framed to make God appear 
as restrictive or to make God's word appear as restrictive. And we have to be careful with that as Christians because we are seconding the, the first lie of the devil or we're seconding the first picture of, the, of God that the devil painted whenever we believe that when we go to God's word, we find a bunch of restrictions. Nothing could be further from the truth. As a matter of fact, what the devil fails to tell you is that God's word, his law, is a law of liberty, of great freedom. See, because without God in the picture, without his word in the picture, you have no freedom. You don't. You don't have no freedom whenever that desire to lie, to get you out of that sticky situation comes, you're going to do it because you have no choice. You're powerless against the desire to lie, to get yourself out of that sticky situation. Whenever that cigarette comes, whenever that desire for nicotine comes calling like an obedient slave and starts doing his finger like this, you come right to it. I was so strung out on cigarettes, I would just walk, ooh, so nasty and disgusting. Go, I, would, I would walk and look on the, 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 the sidewalk to see if anybody left a piece of cigarette that they smoked, and I, me with my nasty self would pick it up and smoke it. That's how enslaved I was. How about when that boyfriend that's after one thing Keep calling you after you said over, after you just told him last night, I'm through with you. I don't want nothing to do with you anymore because I've read your Snapchat and I've read your Facebook and I've seen this girl keep liking you and she keeps liking your comments. And I looked into your, uh, your inbox and I see that you've been having contact with this girl. I'm done with you. And then the very next day he calls you, what you doing? And like an obedient slave, you giggling and kikiing and he, 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 he gets you to come over and some ungodly things take place. You have no resistance. You have no freedom to choose righteousness. That's why you got to be careful about. And then when God's word comes around and says, you shouldn't be dealing with that boyfriend. You shouldn't be dealing with them cigarettes. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't be lying like that. Oh, God, man. I'm just fixed to give up this Christian thing. Elder Bates and, and, and Pastor and Elder Cousins and Elder King and Elder Thompson, man, they just, they, they just, it's just too strict. I've heard that, I've heard that statement about Adventists for a long time. It's too strict. And people of the world show more discipline than the people of the church. The, 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 the ones that, that run them, the Olympics, and Paul referred to this, that those that run in the, in the races, they subject themselves to the strictest lifestyle so that they can obtain a gold medal that in the final analysis of things is going to get burned up in hellfire. And they restrict themselves. They, 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 they put themselves on the strictest diet. They put themselves on the strictest regimen. And meanwhile, Christians, because we want to do what we want to do, want to cast blame on God's word that is restrictive. And I'm going to tell you, I have more fun than any Christian when I go anywhere. I, I have more fun than people of the world. When I play basketball, I play basketball with such freedom. Well, when I used to, you can look at me now and tell I don't play much basketball. But uh, when I play dominoes or whenever I do, go, go camping or whatever I'm doing to enjoy myself, there's no guilt associated with it because I know I'm in Christ. I know I'm his beloved and I know that nature is his and I get more, na more pleasure out of nature than any scientist without God. And what we need to realize is that as a Christian, the true motive should be not that I can't go to the nightclub, but I won't go to the nightclub. See, the nature of the relationship place, automatically places restrictions on you. There are some things, I, I, I mean, with, with my wife, I'm free to do anything, but I willingly place restrictions on myself because I love that woman. 
And that changes the whole equation. Again, we keep going back full circle where it talks about everything has to begin by what do you see? Do you see what I see? Do you see me as a God of great love and great liberality? Or do you see me as restrictive? Because if you see me as a God of great love, just like with any love relationship, you willingly place restrictions. It's not that I don't want to cheat. I mean, it's not that I can't cheat. It's because I don't want to cheat on my wife. It's not that I can't smoke, smoke a blunt. It's just that I won't smoke a blunt. And once he gets you on point number one, point number two is easy. In verse four, Satan tempts us to believe that God is a liar. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. See, the first point was an insinuation. Now, since the insinuation has been bought, he feels Satan felt more confident to go ahead with an outright lie this time. And that outright lie, God says, when you, t when you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, Satan in verse seven, 4 says, you shall, not, you shall not surely die. And that brings up an important point for us to consider because salvation is not merely about what you believe. It's about who do you believe? And see, once Satan has bought you, got you with the, with the picture that God is restrictive, it's easy for him to come in and say, you know what? God said one thing. I'm telling you, God is lying. I'm telling you that you won't die. Now, who are you going to believe? You going to believe me or you going to believe God? See, back then, Satan was not able to follow them around all day the way that he's allowed to do to us today. He could only have access to them at the tree of, at the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And as Eve wandered off by that tree, I can imagine the certain eating some of the forbidden fruit while he was talking to her, while, while he was uh, talking to her. And in defense of God, she overstepped her boundary and actually added something to the word of God that wasn't there. And if anything, what we are guilty of as Adventists a lot of times is adding things to the word of God that aren't there. That what ends up being restrictive a lot of time because we, 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 we tend, because we want people, we, we, we don't really like the, <laughs> the, the quote unquote restrictions of the word of God ourselves. And because others aren't doing it, we want to place things that the word of God did not put in there because we place those, those things in our own lives. Now, I'm not going to get into specifics, but y'all know what I mean. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. And this is what Eve did. She put some stuff that was not there. And I believe that once she said that, Satan picked up on that to get her to sin. She said she had stated that God said that they were not to eat of the fruit, nor touch it, or they would die. And when you read Genesis chapter 2 and 17, verse 16 and 17, nowhere do you read that God said that they could not touch the fruit. Now, it still would have been better if she had not touched the fruit. I would equate that to in the, 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 the injunction in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, where it tells us to lay aside the weights. Weights and sins are completely different things. But what weights do when you don't lay them aside, they lead to sins. And this is what happened in Eve's case. This was a weight. God never told her she couldn't touch the fruit. But she, she added something that God said, and Satan picked up on it and said, I'm going to run with this thing. Again, it would have been better for her not to touch the fruit. But because she did touch it, and it was a weight, it led her to eat it. And it made it easier for Satan to, to, to instill the lie about God within her. I can imagine that as soon as she said that, God said that you shouldn't just said that we shouldn't touch it nor eat of it, we're gonna die. It's, I believe as soon as she said that, it, it, Satan was like, okay, here. And sometimes, and I, and I learned this, this is a sales technique. 
When I lived in Dallas and I used to go door to door selling stuff, one of the things that the guy who, the, who trained me taught me was like, whenever, you, whenever you're presenting it to them, whatever item you have, put it in their hand. They're more apt to buy it. Even if they don't want to buy it, they'll think about buying it just because they touch it. And this is what, this is what Satan did to Eve. Soon as she said that, boom, touch it. Now, did you die? Now she has apparent evidence from Satan that actually the devil might not be lying. It might be God that's lying. And woe unto us whenever we can actually get to a point where we believe that sin is right and God is wrong. Where what we do, our desires against God are right and God is wrong. Whenever we get to a point where we believe the devil's lies over God's word. I began, I believe that she began to believe that God had lied to her and that the serpent was telling the truth. She still had not eaten of the fruit as of yet. She had only touched it. So before she even ate the fruit, she brought the lie that God was a liar. See, God's word has told you, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Don't do any work on this day. You got six days to work. Just don't work on this day so that we can spend time together. There's a blessing for you if you keep it according to Isaiah chapter 58 and also Isaiah chapter uh, 53. That, 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 that there's a blessing for keeping the Sabbath day. But then your job says, you know what? I wouldn't believe that. I wouldn't believe that. God expects you to work and make a living for yourself. And you believe the devil's lie over what God's word has just told you. God tells you to return a faithful tithe and offering. And the light company says, you know what? God really wants you to you know. Actually, it's the devil. Let me tell you who it really is. It's not the light company. It's the devil. The devil's telling you. You know what? God understands that you need your lights. I mean, you know, he wants you to have your lights and have the things that you need. So God won't mind if you withhold it this month just so you can pay your electric bill. And God, 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 will just just save it up. And God and he gets you right there. Believing God's believing the devil's lie over God's word. God said that if you return your faithful tithe and offering, he said there will not be room enough and you won't have room enough to receive it. Oh, yeah, the devil says, well, but 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 I know what God said and that's true, but only when you have it. Oh, Lord have mercy. Point number three, he's gotten us now. We bought the lie. Now he goes a little bit further. Satan tempts us to believe that God is selfish. Let's look at verse five. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So what, this, what the devil has now done is he's gotten to Eve. She's bought the lie, and now he doesn't want her to ever recover from the lie. And one of the most brilliant tactics that one can use in order to ever recover, be recovered from sin, is now you start believing that God is selfish. It's one thing to believe that God is a liar, but now to believe that God is selfish keeps her in a perpetual state of lostness. And he does it subtly. He says, but God, for God doth know. Now with a statement like that, See, God has lied to you, and the, but the reason why God has lied to you is because God knows something that you don't know. You see where he's going with this. And this is what, what that's why we got to be careful whenever, w w that's why the Bible shuns us against gossiping in the spirit of prophecy. Because so often we place these things on people that we, we, we talk about people and we don't even know what we're talking about. We, we're not involved with them like that to know 
why they do certain things that they do. And all it needs to be like, okay, Brian didn't do, you know the reason why Brian didn't do that for you? Because Brian knows. Brian knows that, that if you do that for him, you're going to be a better teacher than he is. You know that Brian, if, 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 if uh, the reason why Brian didn't do that for you is because Brian knows that if you were to really do it, you would, show, you would outshine him. You got to be careful about that stuff. You got to be really diligent in resisting that. And if we really, brothers and sisters, whenever somebody come and tell you something like that about uh, Brian, you need to be like, oh, no, I know Brian better than that. That's not him. But so many of us be like, oh, really? Just like Eve was like, oh, really? So he lied to us because he's keeping something back from us. He's being selfish. And, 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 and I will deposit into your spirit that in many cases, the reason why we sin and the reason why we, 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 we the, yeah, the reason why we sin in a lot of cases is because we see God as being selfish. Whether we do it consciously or unconsciously, what this, what this Genesis narrative is teaching us is that built into every one of us, we have a tendency, tendency at times to look at God as being selfish. The reason why God don't want me to do this stuff is because God knows I'm going to have fun if I do it. The reason why God don't want me going to the club because God knows I'm going to have fun if I do it. God don't want me to have fun. God is just being mean and selfish as to why he keep telling me not to go with that uh, no good girl. This is the educational process, by the way. <clears throat> by the way, I will deposit and let it sizzle in your spirits that if you're not homeschooling, homeschooling your child or if you're not, uh, if you don't have your, your child enrolled in an Adventist institution, these are the very principles that are being pumped into your children every day. And you don't even need to call me or talk to me about it. I, I, I've been in the public school. I know what it's about. And when you deprive them of you homeschooling them, because the only reason why Adventist schools were necessary was because uh, we didn't homeschool like we ought to. Homeschool is, op is the optimal thing. But then if we're not able to do that, the next best thing is Adventist school. And we're cheap. when we leave our children exposed to, 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 to this type of thinking as a part of their educational makeup, no wonder we're losing young people by the droves. And I don't care how you feel about it either. In, 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 in humility. I mean, I really, you know, God told me to say that. This is the same principle that he involved the angels with and he's involved us. saying, you know what, God is holding a higher existence from you. God don't want you to become like him. That's why he's holding this back from you. I'm going to get to the final point so we can close. I don't want to keep you too long. The fourth and final point, found it's also found in verse 5. And as I alluded to earlier, it's the most dangerous of all Satan's temptations. Satan tempts us to believe that God is irrelevant. For God doth know in verse 5, For God doth know in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God's knowing good and evil. See, he tempted Eve to believe that if you can be God, then what do you need God for? That's the whole reason why God is restrictive. That's the whole reason why God is lying to you. That's the whole reason God is being selfish to you. Because in reality, what God knows is that you don't need him. And Eve bought that picture of God. 
And the reason I know she bought it because look at this in verse 6. And when the woman saw, I, I'm going to just stop right there. When the woman saw, remember, do you see what I see? See, in Genesis chapter 2 and, in ver and, and also in Genesis chapter 1, she saw everything the way that God saw it. Now the devil has put, and I didn't put this quote up here because I'm trying to, I tried to save your time, but she goes on, uh, Spirit of Prophecy goes on to say that the devil puts his glasses on us so that we can see things in an exaggerated light. And this is what's definitely happened here. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree, tree desired to, be, to, to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. See, this is like a chain reaction that builds upon another action, that builds upon another action. And if we're going to get out of this mess, we got to reverse the action. We need to start seeing what God sees so that we can believe that God is true so that we can believe that God is generous and very liberal with us. And that we can also believe that, uh, that God is very not only relevant, but necessary to our lives. And this is where Satan is getting her. And this is where he's getting us. Uh, Satan, Satan, Satan is happy when he can tempt us to believe that God is irrelevant or that we don't need God for anything. Not only did he tempt her to believe that she was restrict, that, that God was restrictive, liar, and selfish, but he finally persuaded her that she could live a life independent of God. He convinced her that her eyes were opened by eating the forbidden fruit. Eventually, her eyes was be, would be closed from eating the forbidden fruit. They were spiritually closed the moment she ate it, but they were going to be closed in the sleep of death later on in life. Thus, she could be equal to or greater than God. And if you can be equal to or greater than God, then what do you need God for? You can be your own God. You can be your own boss. If you eat the forbidden fruit, then nobody can tell you what to do anymore, not even God himself. And God knows this, and that's why he, he, he placed that one restriction on you, Adam. Just that one restriction. And no doubt that these were some of the implications of what Satan said in verse 5. Satan always has two counterfeits in every deception, one for the world and one for the church. With the world, he tempts them again. This is about God being relevant. Two counterfeits in this point. One for the world and one for the church. So with the world, he tempts them to believe that they don't need God for anything at all. He tempts them to believe that they can get a job without God, have a family without God, have fun without God, etc. And since they don't recognize any claims of God in any aspect of their life, they refuse to come to church, refuse to come to Christ, or have anything to do with things of a religious nature. They deceive themselves by thinking they can get by and live life without God in it. They think that it is a sign of being uh, mentally strong by not becoming a Christian. Otherwise, other, in other words, if you, become a, if you become a Christian, they consider it a sign of weakness. They simply feel that they don't need God for anything, and that is because they have bought into the same lie that he told in heaven to the angels he deceived and in the Garden of Eden. As for the Christian, he has another counterfeit. Just like with Eve, he also tempts them to believe that they don't need God, but he tempts them to believe that they can be a Christian without God. See, with the world, they, he tempts them that they don't need God at all. But what he tempts the Christian to believe is that we can do Christian things, but we don't need to rely on God for it. What do you mean by that, Elder Bates? Well, I'm glad y'all asked. See, the Bible in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 15 says that Lucifer was perfect until iniquity was found in him. The Hebrew word for iniquity is lawlessness. It is where we get our English word antinomianism from, which means one who believes the moral law is of no use or obligation. 
So in Ezekiel chapter 28, 15, the word iniquity means lawlessness. One who doesn't believe that we need a law. And in Isaiah chapter 14, when it talks about how Lucifer fell, it says that what he wanted to be like the Most High. Well, what is the Most High like? The Most High is loving, caring, long-suffering, just, joyful, holy, gentle, temperate, humble, etc. And when we put line upon line and precept upon precept, like Isaiah chapter 26 says to do, and put these two verses together, we can conclude that he was insane in heaven, that Lucifer was in heaven saying that I can be like the Most High without him. I can be loving without him. I can be a caring Christian without him. I can be a long-suffering Christian without him. I can be just without him. I can be a joyful Christian without him. I can be a holy Christian without him. I can be a gentle Christian without him. I can be a temperate Christian without him. I can be a humble Christian without him. In other words, I can sanctify myself. I can make myself holy. I already am holy. And guess what the Christian world, with, with the exception of SDAs, are proclaiming? I can be loving, caring, I can be just like God without him. In other words, I can be just like God without him giving me a law to tell me how to be that way. I don't need God's law to be caring. I don't need God's law to be just. Because remember, in the, it, with the statement that we read earlier is that the Christian world is in need of seeing the character, God, character of God and his law. So when you're seeing God, you're seeing his law. And when you're seeing his law, you're seeing God. And the Christian world out there is saying, I can be holy without God's law. I can be a Christian without God's law. And as Adventists, since we are proponents of God's law, what he often tempts us to do is saying, I can do these things without really, without really uh, leaning on God for it. So I can pay my tithes, but, you know, I just go to church and go back home. Um, I can do Sabbath, I can teach Sabbath school, but I just go to church and go back home when it's all done. I can be a deacon, but I'll just go to church and go back home when it's done. Don't have no personal Bible study. Don't have no prayer life. Don't do no witnessing. But yet, I'm a Christian. I'm going to close out with this final statement from the book, Great Controversy. Chapter 29, The Origin of Evil. If you can get that slide for us, Graham, real quick. And I'm going to close with this. So it's working with mysterious secrecy and for a time concealing his real purpose under, under an appearance of reverence for God, he endeavored to excite dissatisfaction concerning the laws that govern heavenly beings, intimating they impose an unnecessary restraint. See, when you're talking about God is irrelevant, you're saying God is unnecessary. You're saying that his law is unnecessary. Since their natures were holy, wow. So now he's holy all by himself. He made himself holy. Since their natures were holy, he urged that the angels should obey the dictates of their own will. That's what many human beings are doing, including Christians. Well, you know, we're, we're God's children, so do I really need, do I really need to... to, to, to to go to church in order to display that I'm a Christian. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you have to go to church in order to be a Christian. But what I'm saying is that people that are truly Christians go to church. He, reiter he reiterated his claim that angels needed no control, but should be left to follow their own will, which would ever guide them right. And that's a dangerous place to get to where we're consulting our own will Instead of consulting God's word, instead of seeing things through our own eyes or seeing things through the devil's eyes, we want to see things. We want to see things through God's eyes. That's where we want to be. 
seeing everything through God's eyes and not our own eyes. Because the Bible tells us, the Bible tells us that, that it says the heart is deceitful, desperately wicked, above all things, and who can know it? And then it goes on to say in the next verse, I, the Lord, try the reins of the heart. In other words, I know the heart. See, we don't know our own hearts. That's why it's dangerous for us to follow our own will. The Bible also says, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. See, what Satan is not telling the angels, what he didn't tell Adam and Eve, and what he's not telling us is that following our own will without God, leaving God out of the picture, and following our own will doesn't just lead to bad situations. It leads to death. And that's the gospel truth. Following our own will instead of Adopting God's eye salve instead of anointing ourselves with God's eye salve, instead of seeing things through the prism of God's word, when we follow our own will and our own desires, it doesn't just lead to cancer. It doesn't just lead to bankruptcy. It doesn't just lead to foreclosure. It doesn't just lead to, 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 to whatever. It leads to death. And I'm not talking about this death that we experience here. I'm talking about continuing to go along in that track leads us to eternal separation from God. And I'm so thankful for the cross this morning because every one of these points, the cross was the answer to it. The cross was the answer to it. Painted God is restrictive. The cross answered that and said, as a matter of fact, I'm so, I'm so, I'm so um, liberal that I will take the restriction. I will take everything upon me and you go free. At the cross, after being cross-examined by, 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 uh, by Pilate, by Herod. Nobody could find anything wrong with him. They said, I found nothing at all at wrong in this man. He told the truth. He was not lying. Matter of fact, it was because of that very statement, along with the fact that there was a, a, a sign above his cross that said, this is the king of the Jews, that that, that situational circumstance, that that providence actually led the thief on the cross to being saved because Pilate had said, I found no fault in him. The cross answered every charge. Saying that God is selfish. There is no greater argument against selfishness than the cross. Satan desiring, Satan opened up sin in order to he opened, up sin, he opened up the door of sin for self-exaltation. Christ slammed the door shut on sin by the example of self-sacrifice. You can't get no more selfless than that. And because of Christ's death on the cross, it proves that God and his law are not only relevant, but they are necessary. Because if Christ had not died on the cross, if, Christ, if there could have been another way by which to save mankind, God would not have sent his son on such an expensive errand to redeem us. He wouldn't have sent his son through all that physical torture and then all that mental torture, because that was the greatest suffering at the cross of Christ, that mental torture of saying, of, of knowing that I bear the weight of the sins of the world and there is a possibility that once I go to the grave, I will never come back forever. Now, why would God put his son through the mental torture of all of worrying about being separated from him forever if there would have been another way by which man could be saved. So the cross demonstrates that God's law is not only relevant, but it's necessary 
or he wouldn't have sent his son to endure all that physical and mental torture in order to redeem us. And I present to you today, Jesus. Jesus and him crucified. It's the answer to all of these charges. And if we want to resist temptation, we have to anoint our eyes with eye salve the same way that Jesus anointed his eyes with eye salve. When the devil came to him with temptation, the first thing out of his mouth, it is written. It is written. It is written. And he could not swerve him from allegiance, from his allegiance towards God, because it was somewhere in those Old Testament pages where Jesus looked and said, you know what? I don't see a God of vengefulness and justice. Uh, well, I see a God of justice. Let me correct that. I see a God of justice, but this justice was necessary to put a check on evil. I see this God and I love him and I'm willing to bake, stake my life on what he has written. I'm willing to stake my life on what is written because I love God that much. I see his love for me. And any time the devil comes to me with any question about God, it is written. It is written. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord. Help us to see things as you see them. Rescue us, Lord, from this muddied up picture of God that the devil has used all of our lives to work against us. Help us to see you and see you clearly through the face of Jesus. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless.